Today is July 31st. We are on the flight line of Air Venture 2003. We are looking at the Hughes 1, the Hughes H1 replica, which is being displayed in the aero shell section of the flight line. This is a brief description of the H-1B racer that is being displayed here. Here is more data on the H-1 racer. This racer is a reproduction of the original racer built in, by Howard Hughes in 1935. This reproduction was re built by Jim Wright. Of I would like to introduce you to Jim Wright. Jim Wright is the owner and builder of this marvelous Hughes replica. Jim, it's real good to be here with you and you and, and your airplane. Thank you very much. Uh, we're at Oshkosh uh, celebrating the 100th year of flight. Uh, this airplane is a recreation of Howard Hughes's H1 racer. Uh, Hughes uh, started building this airplane in January of 1934. Uh, he was uh, 29 years old and he decided that he wanted to build the world's best airplane. He got together 18 people, uh, did extensive wind tunnel testing, and this is what they came up with. Uh, Hughes flew the airplane for about four hours and then went after the world speed record for land planes. Uh, he achieved that on September 13, 1935 at 352 miles an hour. He later flew the airplane from LA to New York nonstop in seven and a half hours, getting that record for almost 10 years. Uh, the genius of Howard Hughes was shown by what he accomplished on his first airplane. The first airplane uh, was made out of wood for the wing and metal for the fuselage. Uh, the airplane has one of the lowest drag uh, coefficients for its size, approximately 2.2 to 2.4 square feet flat plate. Uh, that was achieved through 90 days in the wind tunnel at the Guggenheim Wind Tunnel in California. Uh, Hughes uh, went on to quite a few other accomplishments in aviation, but Howard felt that this was his largest accomplishment. Uh, it actually uh, did better than they had hoped. It, it set him apart. He went from being a uh, golf pro and a movie uh, producer to someone that, that had shown that he could uh, do something outstanding. I'll walk you around the airplane. The, uh, the wing of the airplane is made out of spruce and mahogany. The uh, mahogany plywood is eighth inch thick and is four layers thick at the root tapering out to one layer at the tip. Uh, they used that so they could get the smoothest possible airfoil. Uh, this is a 23,000 airfoil, which is used on Bonanzas, RV4s, and uh, a lot of airplanes still today. Uh, the airplane flies very well. Uh, it's very stable in flight. Uh, it wants to go where you point it. The only issue in flight is the ground visibility. Uh, because you're setting so far back, uh, because there's so much fuel in front of you, the visibility over the wing is marginal. Uh, the airplane carries 308 gallons of fuel. At 275 miles an hour, it has a 4,000 mile range. Uh, Hughes uh, flew it from LA to New York in seven and a half hours at about 48% power, and he had about a 500 mile reserve when he landed. What was the date of that flight? He did that uh, in... Uh, uh, January 19th, 1937. Uh, he took off in bad weather in January, two in the morning, kind of the typical time Howard Hughes went to work, and uh, fought bad weather most of the way. Uh, we believe that he lost at least an hour because of weather problems and the lack of oxygen. His oxygen system failed about an hour out. So he we had to run at 14,000 feet instead of the 21 that he was uh, desiring to run at. Uh, the airplane 
we believe uh, most good engineers at the time, aeronautical engineers, paid attention to the airplane. Any airplane that could get the world speed record and fly LA New York nonstop deserved a lot of attention. In particular, Kurt Tank and the Focke Wolf 190 and the Japanese Zero, I think the engineers were paying a lot of attention. They share a lot of similarities. Airfoil, the engine size, number of cylinders, the uh, small diameter of the cowl, uh, a lot of the things were identical. Uh, if you lay both airplanes over one another in the computer, their plan forms are almost identical. Uh, so people were paying attention to, that, to a young Howard Hughes. So he had shown that he had a lot of potential. And uh, later he, he proved that even more. But this was his most successful airplane. And it's the airplane that he talked the most about. It's the only subject that we know of that people actually had to stop him from talking about once he started talking about it. So it really was an important part of his life and the engineers that worked on it. We started building this airplane uh, recreation uh, about five years ago. Uh, it took us uh, 35,000 man hours to build. We were unable to find the uh, original plans, so we had to work off of the original airplane, which is in the Smithsonian. Uh, the Smithsonian was very helpful and allowed us access to the airplane in its entirety. And we reverse engineered it, finding out what the airplane was and how it was built, and tried to get most of the mysteries out of it, and then we started construction. Uh, we had a team of five people on our team, and we had seven subcontractors. Uh, we subcontract out the stuff that we couldn't do. Uh, we subcontracted out the engine cowl to Jim Yonkin and the, the primary woodwork to Steve Wolf. Uh, the rest of the airplane uh, was uh, Kent White and then ourselves. Uh, we flew the airplane first in uh, last year uh, in uh, July 6th. Uh, currently we have 70 hours on the airplane. Hughes only put 42 on his. So we are discovering problems that Howard hadn't got to yet. His airplane was beautifully designed, but it was not perfected. Uh, and my hat's off to what those guys accomplished in 1935. Uh, I believe they were at least a lap ahead of anybody else, especially when you considered it was his first airplane, and it really was a home built. He, he uh, was not an airplane factory. Howard Hughes was a remarkable person in this respect in that he was able to conceive and pursue this project. Tell Absolutely. us a little more about that, Jim. Absolutely. Uh, he was a visionary. Uh, we talked to the people that worked on the crew, and a couple things were in common. Everybody that was on the crew loved working with him. Uh, it was a challenge. Uh, he was a person that pushed the limits. If something wasn't right, he made you do it over until it was right. Uh, he was a great brain, uh, a mind uh, he pulled good ideas out of everybody's brain. Uh, he didn't care whether it was somebody else's idea or his own. Uh, he was going to get the best airplane possible. And uh, he really showed a lack of ego that, that most airplane designers have. Uh, he was willing to take anybody's ideas into the airplane, incorporate it. And it really, uh, in most people's uh, uh, opinion that have studied the airplane, it really was the template for the successful World War II airplanes. Uh, he brought it all together. The wind tunnel test must have done a lot in that respect that the Army Air Corps lived off of in years later, I'm sure. They did. Uh, no one that we know of spent 90 days in the wind tunnel. Uh, I don't mean thinking about it, they were in it that long. They had hundreds of different combinations they tried before they decided what this airplane would look like. They didn't go in with a preconceived idea, it's going to look like this. Uh, Hughes wanted to get the numbers, get the data, and then decide what the airplane was going to be. And, and really that's quite novel, uh, especially for the 30s. The engine. Uh, the engine is a Pratt & Whitney 1535. Uh, they build a total of 2,600 of them. The engine is a military-only engine. It was never certified. And therefore, after World War II, there was really no use for it. Uh, so most of them were scrapped. Uh, we found this engine and it was rebuildable. Uh, we found a half a dozen other engines, none of them rebuildable. Right now, uh, we're still looking for an engine that, that can be rebuilt so we have a spare. If we do get a spare, uh, then we're going to go ahead and break some of the speed records that Howard didn't do. Uh, today, we still have the record on this airplane for its weight category. We got that last year at Reno. Uh, we believe now with a improved propeller, which was mismanufactured, it was not the same as Howard's, 
Uh, now I can run about 360 miles an hour. And we're going to go back and reset that record again. Uh, there are many records between 15 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers that we should be able to get back very easily. And when you think about an airplane that was designed in 1934, being able to go out and, and, and get world records today, it, it says a lot about that original team. Uh, they, they were really looking, they were working outside of the box. Um, you know, it took a lot of the uh, big builders like Lockheed, uh, it took them years to develop an airplane. And for Hughes and his team to start a company and get this product in 18 months is, is mind-boggling. I have no idea how they did it. It was very well planned. Another amazing fact is the range of this airplane. Absolutely. At uh, 275 miles an hour, which is a very low cruise, it will go 4,000 miles. Uh, a normal cruise is at a little over 30%, and that gives me a fuel burn of 29 gallons an hour, and it trues out at 300 miles an hour. Uh, that's our speed we usually go to the air shows. Uh, the airplane's capable of quite a bit more than that, but we hate to push the old girl. Uh, yeah. We will if we have another engine. Right. How did you come on to this, Jim? Uh, I, uh, in, in the 70s, I uh, read a, uh, a 1937 magazine that had an article on this airplane and a young Howard Hughes. And even in the 70s, when I looked at that airplane, it looked like something that could have been designed yesterday and it would have fit right in. And the more I read about it, uh, the, the more I was intrigued by the engineering. And being a self-taught engineer, uh, I was fascinated by the history. How could this team come up with this airplane in 1935 uh, when they're just starting out? It's just a young team. And uh, the fascination just kept growing. And the more we learned about the airplane, uh, the more intriguing it was. And uh, it really has been a very fun journey. What about you, the crew that built this, Jim? Uh, how did you get these guys together? It sounds a lot like Howard Hughes. Well, uh, what we did is uh, we uh, looked at the original in the Smithsonian, and it was a very depressing day when we looked at it. The airplane was incredibly well built, much better than we had thought. Uh, we'd seen a lot of 30s racers, and they, they were really pretty crude, pr pretty easy to build. Uh, we knew the bar was pretty high when we looked at the airplane. And so we had to get the best team possible. We started scouring and, and finding out who could do the best job. And then we started uh, with the team and started training them. And uh, I'm very proud of what they accomplished. Uh, uh, I think uh, the airplane rivals the original, but does not exceed its quality. Uh, the original was beautiful. He uh, started construction on the airplane five years ago. And uh, the first thing we did is we started building the wing. But before we actually uh, firmed up building the airplane, we knew we had to get an engine that was rebuildable. Uh, this engine, the Pratt & Whitney 1535, is the only engine that puts out 750 horsepower that is this small a diameter. It's substantially smaller than a 985. And without the original engine, we couldn't go forward on the project. Uh, we luckily found an engine that was rebuildable, and uh, then we started on the next thing was starting on the wing. Uh, and at the time, uh, Steve Wolf and his wife Liz started building the wing. We started on the fuselage. Ron England, our team uh, leader, who's standing uh, right here in the white hat, he uh, built the fuselage. Uh, it's kind of a lost technology. Uh, it's a butt fuselage with many panels. Each panel has a 5 eighths of a degree angle change. In the wind tunnel, they determined that a 5 eighths angle change was all they could tolerate without disturbing the airflow. So they had to put that many panels in to get the shape. If the airplane had went into production, they would have used a forming die or some other method to get there. This airplane could not be mass produced and it was never intended to be. Hughes was testing the technology of wind tunnel testing, uh, aerodynamics, handling, but this airplane was not meant to be recreated in its exact form. Uh, the labor content is way too high. Uh, with 35,000 hours, there's no way it could go into production. Uh, production airplanes would have bigger panels, less rivets, and would not be nearly as attractive. It would give up some performance. Uh, our first flight in uh, July of last year was uh, an uh, interesting flight. Hold uh, it. Hold it. We're interrupted by a jet takeoff. Go ahead, Jim. 
Um, what we did on the first test flight is uh, we did everything uh, per the FAA uh, test uh, flight procedures. On the first test flight, uh, the airplane exhibited propeller problems. It would not come out of low pitch, so I was stuck at 2600 RPM at 120 miles an hour. Uh, I got back on the ground in about 25 minutes. We went back over the records and found out that Howard Hughes had a similar problem. Uh, what the problem was is that propeller was designed by Howard Hughes. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry for the interruption. Howard uh, Hughes' propeller needed substantially more counterweight to be able to get out of low pitch in flight. When we went back to the photos, we realized that he had modified the counterweights. We did that and then the propeller worked. Uh, we have had one other major problem, which was a gear failure at about 60 hours, and that was caused by a hydraulic cylinder seizing halfway down. Uh, I think Hughes would have probably had that problem had he flown the airplane longer. So how does it fly now, Jim? Uh, the airplane you, is the most stable. It, do you think it flies similar to the original or better? Absolutely. Or I, I believe the airplane flies and sounds like the original. Uh, the airplane is very stable in flight, and uh, it, it's the most stable airplane I've flown. It, it goes where you point it, and the only issue is the visibility on the ground, and because it's a racer, that just was part of the game, uh, but they did a good job on the original airplane. Now, what they, is your proposed projects for this airplane? What do you propose to do with it, Jim? We're hoping uh, to uh, set more world speed records with the airplane. Uh, that is contingent upon getting another engine as a backup. Right now, if we break this engine, we end up with a static display, and we really hate to do that. Uh, so we're, we're groping for a, another engine right now. Uh, the uh, next project after this that we've already started is the Lockheed Sirius, which is the airplane that Charles and Ann Lindbergh uh, flew around the world. Okay. And hopefully we're going to build that in about four years, okay. total time. Did Hughes ever build another airplane similar to this? He did not. Uh, he went on to other things. Uh, the military had no interest in Howard Hughes, and uh, his relationship with them was very stormy. Uh, so they, uh, they kind of uh, agreed to disagree and go separate directions. Well, I hope someday we see this hanging in the Smithsonian also, because it certainly is noteworthy enough to be there. Well, thank you very much. and th Thank you very time. much, Jim. Thank you. We've been talking to Jim Wright. Uh, Jim, what is your address? Where do you live? Uh, we live in Cottage Grove, Oregon, and uh, that's where we built the airplane. Okay. Well, thank you again. On behalf of Timeless Voices of Aviation, uh, this has been a real, real exciting experience for us. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. We are looking at an overall view of the Hughes Racer reproduction. Jim Wright is the man in the hat talking to another gentleman. This is a frontal view of the Hughes Racer. This is another view of the Hughes Racer. Today is August 1st and we are at Air Venture 2003. Right now we're looking at an old Ford trimotor. This is a Russian Polykarkov I-16 and the board pretty well tells the story of the airplane. It's an extremely rare bird. This is another view of the I-16. This is a super Airbus used for transporting huge articles, like space shuttles and things like that. And next door to it, we have the venerable Boeing 307 Transport. This is a 1939-1940 version of the first super airliner. Uh, it was an airliner that was pressurized 
so they can fly at high altitudes with perfect passenger comfort. This is a reproduction of a Pan Am Clipper who flew these airplanes before World War II. This is a McDonnell Douglas DC-10. It is one big airplane. We have a B-17 here. This is Roscoe Turner's Laird racing plane. He won the Thompson Trophy race in this airplane in the late 30s. In this day, it was one of the fastest airplanes around. This is a reproduction of a de Havilland Comet. The de Havilland Comet won the race from Melbourne, or from London to Melbourne, Australia. I'm not sure of the year, it was in the late 1930s. This is a string as I was about to say before the Harrier interrupted us, this is a string of Howard DGs, a very popular pre-war airplane with a great big 985 Pratt Whitney engine and they would really move. This is a really pristine Spartan Executive, a pre-war transport, uh, executive transport type airplane. Here is another shot of that really sharp Spartan Executive. These are a couple of really sharp looking Waco biplane cabin airplanes. This is a Fairchild 24, a very popular pre-war airplane, a good performer too. This is a little Aranka L3. It was used by the Army in World War II as a Liaison airplane. Uh, it was comparable to the L4, the Piper Cub type Liaison plane. This is a Beach Staggerwing aircraft, a very popular pre-war executive transport. This is a Ryan ST. A version of this airplane was used as a trainer, pre preliminary trainer in World War II. This is a Sturman PT-17. It is opened up and ready for judging. A very nice looking airplane. It should do well in the judging. Here we have the most unique airplane in the whole air show. What this is, is a caveman airplane. Uh, the caveman sat there, there was his cockpit uh, right there. Uh, the, the coffee pot was his fuel tank for the one-cylinder water-cooled engine. Up on top, you see the wings? The wings flapped up and down, and that's what, what was supposed to fly the airplane. It also fe featured a wing walker standing up on top of that. If you look at the rear of the airplane, you'll see a cannon sticking out. He was the tail gunner there on this, wing man, this caveman's airplane. This is a running model, an exact reproduction of the Wright Brothers 1903 engine. The engine is ran periodically here during the air show. 
This is a 1946 version of a Cessna 140. This was the first year of the 40s when Cessna 140s were made. It is very near and dear to my heart because this is the airplane that I learned to fly in. That is, Dick Rasmussen learned to fly in. This is a Laird Super Solution. This is the airplane that Jimmy Doolittle won the Tom C. Trophy race in in about 1931, I believe. Uh, we have an exact replica of this airplane in the EAA Museum. This particular airplane is capable of flying and was flown in here. This is Mr. Mulligan. It's a Benny Howard racing plane built in the late 1930s, and it, Benny Howard won the Thompson Trophy race in this airplane. A very fast airplane. Incidentally, this is the plane that the Howard DGG uh, executive transport was copied from. These are three British Sea Furies. They were a very powerful fighter plane and are currently being rebuilt and used as air racers in the Reno Air Races. They are very fast and always finish very well. This is a late version of the Corsair, the Navy fighter. And this particular airplane featured a 3,000 horsepower engine, a great big uh, 4350 Pratt Whitney. It is also flown in the Reno Air Races. This is another shot of that big Airbus transport, an immense airplane. This is a view of the flight line uh, panning from east to north. And this particular area features mostly home-built airplanes. This is a view of the Aero Shell ramp. This is a home-built version of a Newport built, flown by the French in World War I. This is probably three quarters the size of the original Newport. This is a long easy, and it is the, the airplane that Dick Rutan flew around the world. Yeah, a couple of CC3s that they converted. Oh,
This is the P-51 flight line. This is the P-40 that we had in the museum for a year or more. <coughs> this is a Ryan PT-21. A primary training airplane. A Douglas A26. Will you notice the beautiful nose art? <laughs> Here we have World War II cargo planes. This is an American C47 cargo plane from World War II. And here we have the junk German Junker cargo plane. They're both about the same age and uh, time in World War II, but the American was just far superior to the German transport by a long shot. This is a really shiny C-45. Uh, it's a army version of the Beechcraft uh, 18. This is a Grumman Mohawk. It's a army version of the Navy Mohawk. You notice that it has two turbine engines, an excellent airplane with very good range. This is a B-25 from World War II. It's a B-25D model or E model. This is a German Junker transport close up, waiting to take to start the engines. Albatross used for search and rescue by the Coast Guard. This is the flight line for jets and high powered aircraft. This is a 
Navy version of an F-86. A Korean War fighter. You notice the folding wing tips. This is an AD-4 Douglas Sky Raider used in the Korean War. Every year we get a picture of Naked Fanny. This is another AD-4. This is a Grumman Bearcat. And also another Grumman Bearcat. This is the EEA Sweetheart, the B-17, owned and operated throughout the United States by the Experimental Aircraft Association. This is a door that I used to go in and out of to get into the front cockpit. I would put my hands up on the top railing of the door when the door opened and kick my feet up through the door. I was able to do this when I was 70 years old, but now that I'm 80, there's no way I'm going to try it. This is an authentic World War II Jeep with a bunch of GIs in it. We should have had such GI. Hey, no flirtation with the troops there. I particularly like this graffiti on the Jeep. That was a nice thought, I think. I still like these GIs. This is a Grumman Avenger, a torpedo bomber from World War II. It's the type of airplane that George Bush flew during flew in World War II. These are three home-built racing type airplanes. Kind of like a private John This is this the is an aircraft home build section. On a piece of history, ladies and gentlemen. For the it's flight line. Directly every day this week. Beautiful aeroplane. Where else but Oshkosh could you see five tri-motors flying together? In fact, five different types of tri-motors. I can remember, I think back about 85 or 86, Larry. You must have had four or so here. Yeah. That's a Ford tri-motor, owned by EAA, flying by. This is a Wright Brothers reproduction that is actually going to be flown on December 17, 2003 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. You just can't walk by this used racer without taking a picture of it. This is the aero shared shell display area. This is an airplane that Henry Ford had commissioned build, and his idea was to mass produce this airplane as a family airplane to be sold like Model T's were. Well, unfortunately, it never worked out, but it's an interesting example of Henry Ford's thinking. This is the air show, and they're having a bombing mission going on now, and the smoke is in the sky from the bombers dropping bombs. And this is this monstrous Airbus from the front end. Several few slides of the lower compartment. 
Probably a later one. Yeah, yeah that was after the war. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Strata Liner. It's Boeing 307, the first pressurized cabin transport. Pan Am got 12 of them and flew them in until the war began. Then they were militarized. This is a Connie that was flown by the United States Air Force. They call it the Super Constellation. Super G. This is a P-51C. It features the straight back instead of the bubble canopy.